Hey there everyone, how are you today? It is a special Friday edition of the Paula's Choice YouTube live chat with me, Brian Barron. I'm the director of skincare research for Paula's Choice, a little skincare company you may have heard of. Uh, we are off to a roaring start this year. Um, our, our first quarter was um, uh, incredible in terms of some, some um, milestones. We launched at, at uh, Sephora Canada, which is huge. We have always had a really good and very loyal base of uh, Canadian customers. And I know it's been a frustration for them over the years that our product line was not readily available in any of the provinces. Um, you, you were welcome to order from the States, but then you had to deal with the, uh, the extra shipping and the VAT and the other taxes that are imposed on such orders. So now we have a small <clears throat> selection of our best-selling products. I believe there's six of our best-selling products are widely available in Sephora Canada um, and it's just been a huge success there and there are more products coming so um, if you are um, uh, if you are living in Canada it's reason to celebrate well assuming you're a fan of Paula's Choice and hopefully you are or why are you watching this show um, today's topic is um, before I get too much further into our milestones uh, today's topic is I area, it just so happens I have an itch there at this very second, high area anatomy. So what that means is I am going to be talking about um, why the eye area is unique, uh, why it ages uh, first and, and often fastest. If you ask most people, you know, where's your, uh, where's the one telltale area that you feel betrays your actual age and they will likely point to the eye area. Um, and I will explain why that is. We're going to talk about puffy eyes, dark circles, lines and wrinkles, skincare options to help improve the look of eye area concerns, uh, skincare options that if, if started early enough can, can prevent, at least to some degree, what we see around the eye area that we uh, may not or probably will not like, uh, as well as where skin care stops and uh, in-office procedures, and there's, there's, I could do a whole separate show on dermatologist procedures for eye area rejuvenation. Not just um, the non-invasive type procedures, but there are several surgical procedures uh, that a uh, plastic or cosmetic surgeon can offer that can remarkably improve uh, the uh, signs of aging around the eye that either skin care cannot really address at all or can only address to some degree. Uh, and then you, you and it's important to, to realize that because what I never want to see anybody do is, is waste money on eye area products that are over promising or saying something uh, in terms of a claim that, that really just can't physiologically come true. Uh, and there's unfortunately, it's gotten a lot better over the years in terms of brands being more um, uh, straightforward, being literally being more honest about what their products can and can't do. But there are still products, and, and oftentimes they are the most expensive one, uh, or most expensive ones that are um, they're, they're, the claims for what they can accomplish <clears throat> are just beyond what is actually possible topically. The good news, because I don't want that to sound too discouraging, there are a lot of ingredients for the eye area that can make a beautiful difference. With consistent use uh, and with daily sun protection, and I'll talk about why that's so important in just a few minutes, uh, you really can see a great difference in the skin around your eyes. So uh, it is, uh, as much as it's, uh, foolhardy, so to speak, to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on air, eye area products that make false promises. Uh, it's equally foolhardy to take the stance that eye area products do nothing to help skin around the eyes. And even better, <clears throat> many of the ingredients 
in eye area products uh, that can make a significant difference are also found in several well-formulated facial products. So it still remains true that if you do not have a specific eye area concern, such as dark circles, but you are concerned about signs of aging around the eye, the fine lines that you don't want to turn into deeper wrinkles, you can successfully use your anti-aging type facial products, assuming they're well formulated, in the eye area too. And you can test that out, see what kind of uh, results you get, and then decide, okay, do I, based on this, is it, should I switch my facial product out? Should I consider an eye area product to ramp up or amplify the results I'm getting from my anti-aging facial care product? Speaking of that, um, some of you may be aware that earlier, um, well, we're in April, so this launched in March, um, the Pro Collagen Multi-Peptide Booster, uh, which was one of the products that um, I had a, a, a direct role with. I mean, I have a direct role to some degree with all of our products, um, but this was one that I was particularly passionate about because I was such a big fan and regular user of our Peptide Booster, the original, that when we started coming across these newer more innovative, more targeted peptides, uh, and, and, and we wanted to more tightly focus this product's results <clears throat> on the visible impact you'll see when you are able to signal the dermal epidermal junction. This product uh, has just blown us out of the water in terms of the, the uptake for it. It has been uh, popular uh, and beyond what we originally thought, like like all of us behind the scenes, who were you know involved in the ideation and the and the research behind it and the actual formulation, we were super excited. We were seeing the great results. We could not wait to bring this product to market. But even with all of that enthusiasm, there was still, you know, there there there, there was still that unknown. Like you can come to market with a product like that and be super super confident. But until it gets into consumers' hands and you start hearing what they think, people who have, you know, f given us, you know, the, the, their money in exchange for this product, and then they come back and say, "You guys did it again." I mean, this is this is phenomenal. I love it. I've never used anything quite like this. It really does work within minutes. Um, and the best part about this particular booster is that yes you will get um, that near instant line smoothing effect, but it's also formulated for the long haul. Um, and that to me is almost more important, you know, that the, the long-term support this product is going to give you as you go through the years. So two big news points there for the first quarter of 2023. We're thrilled to be in Sephora, Canada, and we are beyond thrilled that the Pro Collagen multi-peptide booster has been so well received and that is absolutely a product that you can and should use around your eyes even if you are already using an eye gel a serum or a treatment or whatever try this around your eyes too and i think you're going to love the synergy that you'll see between the eye area product and this booster so without further ado on this friday before easter both my husband and son are off school and work respectively today. Um, my husband works for a company that is um, when the market closes or the market closes early here in the United States, they get the day off because he works for a financial institution. So anyway, uh, they are out seeing uh, a movie and, um, you know, we're just going to have a chill dinner at home tonight and hang out and see the family this weekend for Easter and this should be a good time. And the weather, it's getting nice and warm here. I'm so happy. I think winter, well, winter is officially over per the calendar, but sometimes in Michigan we'll get some, you know, sneaky snowfall. Uh, it does not look like it, that's going to be the case April 2023, but we have gotten snow in April before. And yes, it's, it can be depressing because it usually comes 
after a run of sunny, higher temperature days and you think, oh, good, you know, we're getting towards actual spring and then it's going to be summer and then, and then you get snow. But that's the Midwest for you. Anyway, eye area anatomy. So although eye area skin is, is thin, this is an interesting fact because what you will often read is that the, uh, the skin around the eyes is the thinnest of anywhere on the face. And that's, although it, it's a bit misleading because um, the skin itself there isn't necessarily as thin as you were led to believe. So yes, that's the skin around the eyes and particularly the eyelid area is definitely very, very thin and thinner than most other areas of the face, such as the, the forehead and the mouth and the cheek. But when your actual measurements, which I don't mean to gross anybody out, but they've actually done measurements on human cadavers um, where they you know, dissect and actually take a look at the literal thickness of skin in key areas of the body, including the face. Where the difference really counts <clears throat> isn't so much <clears throat> with skin, but the subcutaneous fat beneath the skin, which is uh, also referred to as the hypodermis. So you've got the epidermis, the dermal epidermal junction, the dermis, and that DEJ dermal epidermal junction is, is the connection between the dermis and the epidermis. And then below at the bottom of the dermis <clears throat> is the, um, what's sometimes referred to as the hypodermis, but it really is a layer of subcutaneous fat, which gives the skin um, more uh, cushion. It also helps to further protect um, the body's internal organs. Um, and it's, it's an integral part, uh, depending on the facial architecture, uh, the, the, as we age and start to lose uh, or that subcutaneous fat layer sh uh, shifts out of place, which absolutely happens around the eyes, that can dramatically impact how we look uh, and how aged we appear. So, but just as a point of reference, um, the skin, the layer of subcutaneous fat around in the periorb periorbital region, so around the eyes, averages 1.82 millimeters thick. Compare that to the subcutaneous fat in, below the skin in the cheek area, which is four and a half millimeters thick. So that's a fairly substantial difference. The difference between the actual thickness of the skin, such as between like the forehead and the eye area, is about, it's just a tiny, tiny, uh, it's, a, it's a, like a, less than a one millimeter difference, but it's the fat uh, that is really causing that, that skin to be the, the, the lack of fat, I should say, relative to the rest of the face, that it causes that skin to be so delicate and so fragile. The tissue below the eyes in particular is, is missing other essential elements such as muscle. Um, if, you know, for example, you look at your forearm, you've got that, that subcutaneous fat layer, and then there's a, a nice uh, you know, protein-packed, um, sinewy, fibrous muscle underneath there that definitely helps to impact how the skin looks. Under the eye area, you have you have muscles, smaller muscles that are controlling the eye itself that give it that binocular-like ability to focus, that that help the uh, the eyes actually move up and down and to the sides. Um, but in terms of like muscula musculature through here, it is not nearly as robust as it is down here. So that is another disadvantage to the under eye area in particular that allows it to age and look older faster often than other areas of the face. We have several fat pads in the face. The ones uh, right under the eye are called the infraorbital fat pads. And that naturally, not only does that naturally thin which, with age, which again, you're, you're starting at a disadvantage because that is thin, thinner relative to other areas of the face, but then it continues to thin with age. And then it can also start to atrophy or uh, essentially slip out of place. So picture it as a, a nice firm rubber band when we're younger. And then that rubber band starts to stretch 
just because of sun damage, because of the passage of time, because of the repetitive motions around the eyes, and also because of gravity. And then eventually that rubber band that used to be nice and taut like this and bounced back easily, it starts to become more loose. It takes longer to bounce back to its original tautness if it even gets there. So that is another aspect that happens around the eye with age that can lead to um, what some people call under eye bags, uh, which I guess you could kind of ca categorize that as a, a, a type of puffy eye. That, when, and that, the under eye bags, which you will see as how to tell the difference, let's start this way, between everyday puffy eyes or occasional puffy eyes and when you've got under eye bags. Um, first of all, age is a factor. Not very common to see somebody in their mid 20s, for example, that really has true under eye bags, meaning that that fat pad beneath the eye has shifted and fallen out of place and it's now kind of pooching beneath that thin skin and it just does not have that support. Therefore, you've got this constant saggy, baggy look under the eyes um, and it doesn't go away no matter what you do. That is a, a major difference and, and also you're much more likely to encounter that as you're in your late 40s to early 50s and older than you would be in your 20s or 30s. Maybe if you have had an exceptionally high amount of sun damage relative to the average person your age, that can accelerate that process even further. Um, but it really is more, although environmental damage can hasten it, it's really more of an intrinsic uh, number of candles on your birthday cake type thing, uh, which is why the average age of people having um, uh, a procedure known as blepharoplasty, which is literally making an incision uh, inside the lower eyelid and then bringing that fat pad back up to where it should be and suturing it into place so it stays there. Um, I believe the average age for that procedure is around 59. Makes sense though, because that's right around that time frame for most people. If they're going to experience that, some people are lucky and, and they don't, all of us are gonna have some fat pad thinning and fat pad shifting both above and below the eye as we age. It's just inevitable, but because of genetics and because of facial architecture and you know how much other supportive uh, element you have, mostly bone in that area, um, the how that looks <clears throat> and when it happens and the severity of it um, can vary. But the good news is, is there are those in-office uh, surgical procedures, both upper, you can have an upper blepharoplasty and a lower blepharoplasty. Uh, again, some people find that they get the bags uh, under the eyes first, and then maybe five to 10 years later, they start noticing uh, upper eyelid puffiness. Um, that it, That is partially due to uh, the forehead these, uh, the, the muscles uh, up here uh, and the fat pads in the, in the forehead starting to droop. And that, that also creates uh, a heavier look to the brow. So you're basically putting more pressure on the upper eye area and then the, it's kind of bearing more weight, literally, and that causes that upper eyelid area to protrude. So blepharoplasty can help with that, uh, as can, uh, you can talk with a cosmetic surgeon about having an eye lift. Um, which is a different type of surgical procedure. So the bottom line is that that eye area aging is not only influenced by environmental damage over the years, but just that uh, factors beyond your control are that gradual loss of volume, the forehead drooping, bone loss, uh, and the effects of gravity, which uh, again, all of those things are pretty much out of our control. We can't escape that. Uh, we can't eliminate or ignore gravity unless we want to live in outer space, which would present a whole other set of problems. So whether for any signs of aging around the eyes, including fine lines, wrinkles, and just that general loss of firmness and loss of resiliency, the general prescription, so to speak, is that anything you can do to stimulate collagen, reduce inflammation, 
and stop further environmental damage will all help the eye area uh, look younger, uh, look more vibrant, bounce back faster than it has. And I mentioned several minutes ago, I was gonna get to sunscreen. It is foundational, and, and if you are serious about uh, addressing concerns around your eyes, sunscreen is non-negotiable uh, because pretty much everything that we end up not liking <coughs> about the skin around our eyes uh, is either directly caused by or worsened by repetitive exposure to UV light without adequate protection. I don't want you to just stop at sunscreen though. I want you to also strongly consider, even on cloudy days, wearing sunglasses outdoors. Or if you wear prescription eyeglasses such as these, I haven't gone this route yet because these are mostly for reading and seeing up close because I'm at that age where I have um, presbyopia. Um, and it's very frustrating if you're in my age range and going through the same thing. It's very frustrating when you need vision correction to just read things and see the fine print, so to speak. But like, if I drive with these glasses on, I, I can't. It's just because it, I can still see fine farther away. <clears throat> I just can't see as well close up when it comes to looking at letters and words. So here we are, but tangent, the point was you can talk to your ophthalmologist or your optician about getting those transition type lenses so that when you are outside on a um, overcast and a sunny day, your lenses will automatically darken. You won't have to take your glasses off, fish for your sunglasses and put those on. That's the boat I'm in right now. So I literally just leave the house with both. But um, the take home message is that there is a lot sunglasses can do along with sunscreen to protect not just your eyes, that's the sunglasses part, but the sunglasses also play a role in protecting the skin around the eyes too, particularly if they are a larger, more wraparound style frame. So don't get a pair of those late 60s John Lennon type circular lenses that pretty much just cover the eyeball itself and leave this whole area vulnerable, that's what you want to protect. So more of that, uh, like the, the type of sunglasses that you see um, downhill skiers uh, wear when they're out in the snow before they don their, their ski goggles, that type of thing, that more of a wraparound style. And if they have a temple, <coughs> if the um, side pieces are wider at the temple to help block UV light from getting in through the sides, that's even better. Um, and it can be brilliant protection for your eyelid area, which is where most of us um, are, are hesitant to apply sunscreen, particularly the non-mineral variety, because what happens is uh, over time, that sunscreen that you may put on your eyelid will shift and run and get into the eye itself and cause stinging and redness, no fun. Um, let's talk a bit about <clears throat> dark circles, causes and treatments. Um, definitely a frustrating skin concern, something that many people deal with to one degree or another. There are, there are two major types of uh, dark circles, which is also referred to in the literature as periorbital, periorbital darkness. Um, there is uh, the type of dark circle that is caused um, due to hyperpigmentation, so uh, an excess of melanin deposited under and or around the entire eye socket. Uh, and then there's also um, a vascular uh, type of dark circle that is caused by um, oxygenation of, of blood. Again, you've got without as much fat and the thinner skin uh, that the um, dilated capillaries are more visible. Uh, how that is going to look in terms of a dark circle really depends on um, the depth of your skin color. So somebody who is light complected, such as myself, we're going to see it more as a reddish blue to purpley red discoloration. Somebody that has more melanin rich skin, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, I can never say this actor's name correctly, the one who appeared in Black Panther and now his name is escaping me altogether incredibly gorgeous man. Um, 
is it Chadwick Boseman? Maybe that's who I'm thinking of. But on um, somebody with that skin color, the darkness is going to look more, it's anywhere from like a brownish black and there may even be tinges of uh, like almost a navyish blue uh, or a deeper purple color. So they can take on kind of a range of colorations. What a lot of people are dealing with, particularly if you have, the more melanin you have in your skin naturally, the skin's pigment, the more, if you are dealing with dark circles, the more likely you are dealing with the hyperpigmented type of dark circle. Whereas the less melanin you have, the more likely you are, if you have dark circles, you are likely dealing with a vascular cause. Now, can some people, regardless of skin color, have both types? Yep. That is why um, any good eye cream that is uh, claiming to target <clears throat> dark circles and help to improve their appearance is going to contain one or more ingredients that address both types. Because again, if you've got that combo going on and you only have ingredients that target the hyperpigmentation aspect, okay, then what about the vascular aspect? So you really have to go after both because if you've got the, the combo, you've got two different contributing factors to that under eye shadowing. There, um, in addition to sunscreen, again, non-negotiable, uh, particularly if your dark circles are, a hyper, are the hyperpigmented variety, because that ongoing unprotected exposure to the sun is only going to fuel that discoloration. How do you know if you have uh, genetic or inherited dark circles versus just dark circles from sun damage, dark circles from allergies, dark circles from just getting older or maybe staying up too late? Um, first of all, it's, it's a myth that dark, that, that dark circles are caused by a lack of sleep. It's, it's sort of like stress causes, the myth that stress causes acne. Stress plays a role in acne pathogenesis. It can certainly heighten it. But if you are not genetically predisposed to having acne, because some people aren't, everybody has stress. You know, so if you know, everyone has some deg degree of stress in their daily lives, so why don't all of us have acne? Uh, and the reason is that some of us have a genetic predisposition to acne. Some of us will outgrow that. And it's the same for dark circles. If you have always had dark circles, you know, you look at pictures of yourself as a child and maybe they're not as pronounced as they are now that you're an adult because you've accumulated some sun damage along the way. Uh, all of us are guilty of that, don't feel bad. Um, but if you can look, if you look back at pictures of yourself and you see that there's a little bit of shadowing under your eyes and then as you get older, it's becoming more pronounced, very good chance that your dark circles are hereditary. Of course, you can also look to other family members. You know, if, if your mother was always complaining about shadows around your eyes or your dad always had darkness above here, um, your aunt, your, you know, you can kind of look back and say, eh, well, that was, you know, good old Aunt Gladys had that too. That's a good sign that you're dealing with genetically inherited dark circles. Um, I mentioned allergies, I mentioned sun damage, uh, rubbing the eyes, all of those things uh, can trigger uh, inflammation and inflammation can make dark circles worse. We know from research that inflammation, that um, the creation of excess melanin has a tie-in with inflammation, which is why I mentioned earlier, uh, and this is the same thing with wrinkles and fine lines and collagen destruction, anything you can do to be gentle around the eyes, to use soothing, anti-inflammatory type ingredients is going to help. And conversely, the rougher you are on the skin around your eyes, the, the more you use irritating ingredients. Uh, I was looking at a very popular skincare brand's eye area products and uh, just today, and not only was I shocked at how expensive they become and the fact that they're still in jars, um, although honestly they didn't have too many lighter air sensitive ingredients to speak of, you know, breaking down. What really shocked me is how much fragrance was in them. And natural or not, one, if you're going to, if you're going to nix skin fragrance in any skincare product, I, I ultimately that should be the goal for every product that you put on your, your, your face and body. Um, 
But if you're gonna, you know, disavow fragrance in just one product, it should be products for the eyes because the skin is definitely more delicate. It can definitely be, be more sensitive. You know, if somebody is complaining about a stinging reaction from a sunscreen, they're almost always saying it stings through here. They're not saying it stings down here on my cheek. Um, it's almost always the eye area that they notice it first and where it tends to be heightened. So the gentler you can be with that area, the better. Um, some cases of dark circles respond beautifully to the same types of ingredients that you would use to address a dark spot elsewhere on the face. Multiple types of vitamin C, niacinamide, licorice root, azelaic acid, retinol or other retinoids, all of those ingredients play a role in helping to fade dark circles that have a melanin component to them. For the vascular component, that can be more stubborn. There's certainly fewer ingredients that have shown good evidence of being able to visibly address that. One of the ones that I really like that we incorporated into our C5 Super Boost eye cream is a component, a plant component from ginger uh, known as Zerumbone. And part of why that ingredient is so effective is it, it, it can definitely act on helping to fade the um, hyperpigmentation cause of dark circles, but it has a dual action and that it is, uh, this particular component is so soothing that it can also help to visibly improve vascular dark circles as well. Uh, and I've seen some of the customer reviews for this product <coughs> and I've been, I've been very pleased with how many people are saying uh, this is the only eye cream that I've ever used on my dark circles that really makes a difference. Um, that was one of the things we were really striving to achieve with this formula. It, uh, you know, and we're not over promising with it. You know, we, there's definitely a point, uh, particularly with darker and genetically influenced dark circles where there's only so much you can do. So for the most part, you can pretty much get to the point with skincare where you can somewhat undo the extra darkening that environmental exposure or other issues outside the body caused. Uh, and then at that point, you need to go to a dermatologist and talk about uh, the various in-office procedures. And there are many. There are various light uh, emitting procedures, uh, some derms, will do gentle peels around the eye. Uh, some of them will suggest a combination of peels followed by uh, light emitting procedures. And you'll probably need several of those to really get to the point where you can say, wow, I see a dramatic difference. Um, some dermatologists will also use hyaluronic acid fillers, particularly in the tear trough area, uh, because putting some volume back in that area and bringing as this area, I should take off my glasses, as this area starts to sink in a little bit by, by doing an injection in the tear trough area and you want to see someone who knows what the hell they're doing with this. Do not ever do something like this at a mall kiosk or at your hair salon or if your dentist says I can do that, get a second opinion please uh it's very easy to um mess this up and end up with complications uh and anything that's that close to the eye just just use caution but when done well by somebody who is highly trained and has done the procedure before you can raise up this area with the filler and that will make the under eye darkness that you know if you think about the way the eye is set in the skull you know we have a natural shadow here period and um, just as a quick side note never evaluate your dark circles standing under overhead light particularly fluorescent light uh, it will automatically make them look worse I promise and who wants to look in the mirror and feel bad about themselves right so at the very, the best thing to do is either to have side lighting, kind of like what I have going on now, um, or take a look at your under eye area in natural light and kind of hold the mirror out like this. Again, don't, you, what you don't want to do is dramatize the shadows that will make that under eye darkness, assuming you have it, look even darker and more foreboding. So we want to avoid that and 
where was I going with that? Uh, I was talking about... Hmm. If you're seeing some volume loss through that area, talking to a dermatologist who does dermal fillers in the eye area, and, and you want somebody who is familiar with working in what's called the tear trough area, uh, that can help. And that type of procedure uh, would definitely be less painful than light emitting procedures. And uh, from what I have read, the results of that can last anywhere from nine to 12 months. So it lasts longer than say getting hyaluronic acid lip filler, which tends to wear off in about three to six months. So, uh, but pros and cons, something to discuss with your doctor. The take home message is there are several in office options to help with under eye darkness. Um, some people, if they're dealing with the vascular type of dark circles, may find that an oldie but goodie procedure known as sclerotherapy uh, can help where they inject a, uh, it's an irritating substance that they inject into the veins or the capillaries under the eye and that causes them to collapse, shrink, and then the body resorbs them and breaks them down. You will get a pretty swift reduction in the vascular discoloration under the eye. However, you want to again, if you were to, if you want to explore that option for vascular dark circles, you need to make sure that you find somebody who is very experienced in that type of injection under the eyes, um, because a lot of sclerotherapists pretty much stick with the legs uh, for varicose veins and things like that, because that's kind of the lion's share of their business. Um, so again, you want to find somebody who has ample experience in that area. <clears throat> so what about puffy eyes? Um, oh, really quickly, circling back to dark circles. <clears throat> ah, ha, ha. Didn't mean to say circle back. Um, a, a good concealer <clears throat> can, <clears throat> can work wonders. It really can. Dark circles aren't something that you have to have staring back at you every day. Um, one of my favorites, and it comes in a great range of shades, and it's inexpensive, is Maybelline's, I think it's called Instant Age Eraser. It's a twisty up concealer, and it has a little sponge applicator. Um, if, you, if you try that, and you find that it doesn't give you quite enough coverage, try layering it. Um, I've, I've used that in the days when I was doing makeup. It's still made. It it's, still does very well. Um, but I would use it on um, brides and bridesmaids that had under eye discoloration and they would often come to me with kind of a heavier duty creamy concealer and it just didn't look right on their skin uh, or the, the color was off um, or it may have been a great color and, and given them the camouflage they needed but it creased horribly um, and that's not their fault, it's the formula's fault. So what I found though is when I was using this Maybelline concealer, I would I would do maybe three or four layers of it for really dark circles, where if your dark circles are like more on the mod mild to moderate side, you know, one, one layer gently patted on uh, and set with powder would suffice. So definitely experiment with concealers. There's a lot of great ones out there in all price ranges. You do not need to spend a lot of money to get a great concealer. Um, but what ultimately counts <clears throat> when you're dealing with dark circles on a daily basis is finding a concealer that you're thrilled with, that when you put on, you're like, wow, you know, problem solved. Um, so in that case, in my opinion, how much you spend, as long as you're not seriously overshooting your, your budget, you know, you're not buying concealers and then now you can't pay the electric bill. Um, how, how much you spend is completely up to you. You know, if what you're using is giving you the results you want and you just love it, I'm not one to say don't spend that much money. I'll certainly tell you that I found some great concealers from the drugstore, but maybe you won't like those as much. Okay, so puffy eyes. We talked a lot earlier about under eye bags. That is a type of, some people will call that puffiness. Um, but that is a type of puffy eye that skincare can't address. You may find a handful of products that contain um, alkaline or more constrictive ingredients like sodium silicate would be one of them. Uh, some of them contain egg white because you ever get egg white on your skin and then just let it dry. What happens? It gets kind of tight. It forms a film, dries clear. 
Um, but these in, th those ingredients work by virtue of, of constricting the area. So but they're not constricting the bag as much as they're constricting the skin. As a I'm going to use this every so often type thing. Maybe you've got, you know, your 40th high school reunion coming up and you want to look your best, but you don't have the funds or the time for surgery. I can concede to using a product like that in those occasions, but otherwise daily use of something like that is in the long run, it is going to irritate your skin and, and ultimately lead to uh, a worsening of signs of aging around the eye uh, as a trade-off for a temporary improvement. So that is a preamble of sorts to just say when you are dealing with under eye bags or uh, that heaviness on the, in the underbrow area where the underbrow area is also looking puffy, because um, people usually don't say I have above the eye bags, uh, it, it's time to talk to uh, a cosmetic surgeon. And uh, the blepharoplasty procedure I mentioned earlier, it won't be covered by insurance unless you your doctor uh, will say that this issue is obstructing the patient's vision. Uh, and in a lot of times that's that's just simply not the case. Um, so then in that, in that sense, it is considered a cosmetic procedure, meaning you will pay 100% out of pocket for it. Uh, the average cost of a blepharoplasty in the United States uh, today is around $3,300. You live in a bigger city with lots of surgeons and whatnot, you expect to pay more. You live in a rural area, smaller town, I would expect to pay uh, a little bit less than that average. Um, but all things considered, for the amount of improvement you'll get and the fact that, that those results are going to, if it's done well, it'll last you a good 10, 12 years. You know, and if you, to me, that's that, if I was dealing with that, I would save my pennies for that type of procedure. Otherwise, pretty much every other type of puffy eye, like due to allergies or due to fluid retention or due to some sort of an irritation around the eye, that's what skincare can help. Uh, like a product like our Resist Anti-Aging Eye Gel, super light silky formula. You've got this metal applicator that feels cooling and refreshing. It's kind of like a mini um, jade roller of sorts. Uh, and you don't need to use a lot of pressure. You can just massage it and, it, and it's because it's metal, it stays cold for several seconds. So I love it. I think this feels very refreshing in the morning, you know, even if you're not dealing with morning puffiness, just to kind of massage that around the eyes. And it's just, it's kind of a literal eye opener. Um, so I like the anti-aging eye gel for that purpose. And this formula uh, contains several soothing, uh, calming, plant extracts. We did not use any constricting ingredients. <clears throat> we do have some skin firming peptides uh, in there, but they're not the uh, instant result variety. They're more of the um, uh, slow and steady wins the race. Um, but that type of product is an excellent example. And it's why most products for puffy eyes tend to have a gel-like consistency because that just feels more refreshing uh, and, and cooling without being irritating. Uh, so, you know, no ingredients like menthol or mint derivatives. Um, if you are dealing with morning puffiness, uh, first of all, chronically puffy eyes um, almost always have an allergy component. So be sure to talk to your doctor uh, about getting, if you're, if you're not currently taking an allergy medication because you don't know if you really have allergies or not, your doctor can always order tests to determine what, if anything, you may be allergic to. Um, you know, the, the prevalence of allergies in society has only increased uh, over the years. So, uh, and for some people, because of the amount of histamine that is released in response to the allergen, whether it's something internal, whether it's from inhalation like pollen, whether it's from uh, external contact, that can cause uh, fluid retention under the eyes that, boom, you've got puffy eyes. So absolutely consider that factor. 
Uh, do consider whether or not you have a, a habit, and a lot of us aren't even aware that we do this, of rubbing the skin around your eyes or like doing this when you're tired and you know kind of doing this with your face that can also uh, exacerbate the uh, set the stage for puffy eyes uh, so can uh, too much sodium in your diet so can too much alcohol in your diet uh, and if you are typically waking up uh, and you you know you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning you're like oh I always have these puffy eyes right when I get out of bed Try sleeping with your head elevated. You know, if you normally use one pillow, try two or even three. Just, you know, experiment with that because there, there may be some quick and simple solutions you can do, some lifestyle modifications that will stop that puffiness from being a daily intrusion. Um, but again, there are many, many different ingredients, mostly of the plant variety, um, that because of their soothing properties, they really help to take down that puffiness and they can do so fairly quickly. Um, don't bother with cucumbers. <clears throat> they may feel nice, but there's nothing uh, in particular about cucumber itself that is a magic cure for puffy eyes. You know, if you want to slice up a chilled cucumber, you're doing a spa night at home, put a couple over your eyes and just lay back and relax. That's fine. I mean, for the relaxation element, great. But don't do it on the daily in the hope that it's going to alleviate your puffy eyes because it, it, it won't. Um, let me see. I've got about 15 minutes left. Let me see if we can. I'll, I'll get to a few questions. <clears throat> uh, Demi Mondain 13 says, Hi, Brian. When I do tretinoin at night, I apply what's left on my fingertips under my eyes with no irritation. Is tretinoin too much for that area? What's your opinion? Always enjoy your videos. Thank you. Um, I think using tretinoin or other prescription retinoids around the eyes is fine. I would be, uh, as with any prescription retinoid, you need to be mindful of how your skin responds. Uh, some people can't use them every single night. They have to do every other night or every third night. Uh, I, would, I would be cautious about putting a prescription retinoid on my eyelid, um, maybe up here. Um, I, I still think there's a little bit too big of a risk of it accidentally getting pushed into the eye. Uh, you can always ask your, your doc or your pharmacist uh, about their opinion in that regard. But um, yeah, I think as long as what you're doing with what's left on your finger, you're not like starting in towards the tear, the, the tear duct and then moving out, um, the, the better approach is to kind of start like right here and move out or like start back here, you know, where, where the crow's feet are, and then just kind of work your way around like that. And then as the tretinoin warms to your body temperature, some of what you put you dabbed on is gonna migrate a little closer to the eye. So it'll do that on its own. You don't need to get it like right up under the lash line. Oh, yes, Fo McCoy to my sunglasses comments. His glasses like Joan Collins and Dynasty. Yes, the 80s were a great decade for super huge sunglasses, like almost larger than life. Um, and if you watch any of the Real Housewives shows, uh, the, the reality show, um, you'll often see you'll often see those ladies sporting very large sunglasses. Because you know, when you live in a place like Los Angeles or Miami, uh, that's that's sunny like that year round. I mean, they know you got to protect your eyes. It's not just about the skin around the eyes; it's the eyes themselves. Tim says, "Not sure if this will be mentioned during your talk, but I had a procedure called plasma pen or plasmage around my eye area, which is essentially burning small holes in the skin to tighten it. It produced a lot of transient swelling and scabbing that lasted about a week. It looked pretty hideous and was very painful for about 12 hours, but I was quite it was quite effective." <clears throat> it's only recommended for lighter phototypes, though. I currently use your C5 eye cream and love it. I have not heard of that procedure, Tim. It sounds interesting. I'm assuming they used your own plasma, um, which is a good source of various growth factors that can definitely uh, influence the skin around the eyes. And then, of course, uh, getting it a bit further into the skin like that in that situation can help. I just want to clarify that not everything you put on the skin needs to get, you know, as far in as possible. You need some things to remain on the surface and within those uh, superficial layers uh, because that's your first line of defense against the outside world. 
Okay, Lulu says, hi, Anna. Not really a question, but I hope PC comes out with a mineral SPF 50 someday because I can't handle chemical SPF around my eyes. Um, Lulu, we're always looking at doing, uh, trying to hit that SPF 50 target and, and doing so uh, with mineral actives. It <clears throat> It's tough. I mean, I, I full transparency here. Um, Unless we go the nano route, um, uh, very, very small particles of zinc oxide and or titanium dioxide, which a lot of consumers don't want, I get it. Uh, and then there's regulations in certain parts of the world uh, around declaration of nanomaterials. Um, we will use nano ingredients if they are over 100 nanometers, which is considered a good threshold in terms of 100 and up for safety. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, the amount of UV filters of the mineral variety that you need to use to hit SPF 50, <clears throat> to some degree, it's almost like a, a, one, a, a one for one. And there's, it, it, it's to the credit of sunscreen chemists, including those that we have on, on staff at Paula's Choice, that they're able to create higher SPFs with minerals that give that broad spectrum protection and the gentleness that mineral actives have uh, and pleasing aesthetics. So yes, you could make, you know, you could use 25% zinc oxide and 3% titanium dioxide and very go to market or go to testing confident that you're gonna hit SPF 50. You know, at the very least you might get to like a 49. Uh, and then tweak the formula, you test again, and lo and behold, you've reached 50. But most consumers would find the aesthetics of that type of a formula just kind of made off the bench undesirable. Uh, either it's going to feel heavy, it's going to feel occlusive, it's not going to, not going to apply smoothly, uh, or this is the big one, it's going to leave a noticeable white cast or depending on the depth of color in your skin, uh, you may perceive it as gray or lavender. Again, you know, cross all those off the list. Nobody wants that. So it's tricky. Uh, we're, we're continuing to, to look at various options. Um, one of the workarounds uh, to that would be adding a tint to the formula. But the, the, the issue with that is that a single tint isn't going to work for everyone. There's always going to be a group of people, uh, typically at uh, opposite ends of the skin color spectrum. So the, the, if you've got a single tint, the very, very light people can't use it. It's too dark. And the very dark people can't use it. It's too light. Uh, and then you start talking about, well, do we do three tints, four tints, five tints? And then do we have a daytime moisturizer with sunscreen or do we have a foundation, you know, or a tinted moisturizer? So it very quickly gets confusing and um, <clears throat> I get why a lot of brands aren't doing uh, a tint or they're doing a tint that is <clears throat> so sheer. It does, for the most part, work for all skin tones, but it also isn't doing enough to mask the white cast, which was the whole point. Okay. Theo uh, says, say, hi from Finland. I got a trial tube of PC Clinical Ceremony Rich Firming Eye Cream. This one right here. Uh, I've been using it for a few weeks and I noticed that my eye area is getting drier than usual. Any thoughts? You know, I would try, I mean, if you're, if you're otherwise liking the results of this eye cream, uh, it is not our most moisturizing eye cream. It, full disclosure, if, you, if, that's, if that's what you need because the skin around your eyes is dry, this is not the one to choose. We have better options in that regard, such as the Resist Anti-Aging Eye Cream <coughs> or got this one here too, the Omega Plus Complex eye cream, definitely more hydrating. This one is more treatment oriented. You've got the ceramides and the fatty acids. It doesn't take a lot of those uh, in terms of concentration to make a nice difference and, and improving skin's bounce back and its barrier, but you may not perceive that as feeling super hydrating or super plush or supple. So. If you don't want to switch eye creams and try one of the other ones from us that I mentioned, what you can do is get a bottle of our um, Moisture Renewal Oil Booster. 
or if you don't want to bother with that, you can go to your local health food or grocery store and get a small bottle of a non-fragrant plant oil. Evening primrose, barrage, uh, grape seed would be great. Don't get pure olive oil. The um, oleic acid content of pure olive oil it can, is high enough that it can actually be barrier disruptive uh, as opposed to barrier beneficial. When olive oil is blended with other emollients and oils, you don't have that problem. But if you're talking putting pure olive oil on your skin, in my book, that's a no-no. But you can blend. See, I'm even like feeling this again. This this does not feel very hydrating to me, but it's it's definitely packs in the treatment ingredients in terms of vitamin C and the retinol and the ceramides. Um, try blending a drop or two of either our oil blend or a single non-fragrant plant oil with this eye cream and see if that helps. Uh, DJ Baskey says, hi from Dubai. I'm hoping that PC would look into distributing products at Sephora in the United Arab Emirates. Love your content and energy as always. Thank you so much. Um, I will pass that along. <clears throat> I'm not involved in uh, that side of the business. Um, and it's not, but it's not like I can't ask the people who are. Um, and yeah, I'll let you know. I think that would be, I mean, at the very least, it would be kind of cool to be in um, some of the duty-free shops at the airports there. I know Paula has been to that part of the world or had stopovers in that part of the world many times. And she just is in awe of how gorgeous it is, um, all the buildings and the gorgeous airports and whatnot. So thank you for that. And we're going to wrap up uh, just a few minutes early today. And I'll be back in a couple more weeks with another live chat. I'm not, I think it's going to be, no. <gasps> Ooh, you guys are going to want to tune in for this one. I was going to say it was going to be an Ask Me Anything topic, but now I'm recalling it's going to be another show about a new product launch. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You'll have to stay tuned to Paula's Choice, but you're really going to like it. Anyway, <laughs> on that note, uh, if you are celebrating the Easter holiday, I wish you a beautiful, peaceful Easter holiday. Um, and if not, um, I still wish you a beautiful, peaceful weekend, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.